Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fred Call. I'm president of United University Professions. And I'm here to be host to a really remarkable, at least that's how I anticipate it to be, remarkable panel discussion on mental health. It is the fourth mental health panel that UUP has held over the past couple of years. And it reflects this union's commitment to focusing our collective attention on what is a national crisis. Today, our topic is Profiles in Mental Health Courage by Patrick Kennedy. And today we do have the privilege of hearing from two distinguished panelists, including Patrick Kennedy, former Congressman and author of the book Profiles in Mental Health Courage. This is a book that shares inspiring stories of individuals who have shown incredible resilience in their mental health journeys. Patrick Kennedy is one of the world's leading voices on mental health and addiction. He works to unite government leaders, philanthropists, private sector stakeholders, and advocates to revolutionize our healthcare system to treat illnesses of the brain on par with illnesses of the body and to call for and to bring about a national movement to address the mental health crises we face. Next, Dr. Joyce DeWitt Parker. She joins us from the University at Albany, where she has served as Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs since April 2020. Prior to taking on this role, she served for nearly two decades on the clinical staff of the University at Albany's Counseling and Psychological Services. Dr. DeWitt Parker has over 35 years of experience in mental health care. Her portfolio includes student health services, campus recreation and wellness, the Office of Health Promotion and Scots and Counseling, and psychological services, and sexual violence support, prevention, and education services. Two years ago, Dr. DeWitt Parker led efforts to establish UAlbany as the first university in New York State to be designated as a health promoting university. In addition to working with individuals and couples as a clinician, she has established programs and developed policies to support at-risk at college students. So here's how things are going to unfold today. First, I will begin with several questions for Patrick Kennedy to gain some insights into the inspiration behind his book and highlight some of the stories that are featured therein. Then I will turn to Dr. DeWitt Parker with some questions to provide us with an overview of common mental health challenges, the impacts of stigma, and the importance of advocacy. Following this conversation, and it will be a conversation, that's how I prefer these panels to work. Following that, we will go to a moderated discussion, which I will let flow as freely as possible, that will be focused on questions that come from those who have already submitted questions in advance, but then also those of you who have posted questions in the chat. Please feel free to do that, okay? Just post questions in the chat. I will pay attention to them as best I can, as will our great staff, and I will get to as many of those as possible. And so, without further ado, I would like to turn to our conversation and turn first to uh, Patrick Kennedy. And Patrick, it's great to see you once again and to have Thanks, this opportunity man. for the conversation. Yeah, I hope all is doing well for you. Thank you. Um, to begin with, I, and I realize it's a pretty basic question, but I would start with uh, this this remarkable book, um, and and I and I read it. I I, I devoured it uh, very quickly, um, and and it was just a, a a book that that left me um, stunned in terms of uh, the personal lives and the cur the courage displayed on so many in so many of these lives. Um, I want to start with. What was your inspiration to do this? Uh, what brought you to the point of saying this is something that you believe is necessary uh, in moving us forward in addressing the mental health crisis facing our country? Well, thanks so much, uh, Fred and uh, Dr. DeWitt Parker. Great to be with you and 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 Fred with all your members. Um, so grateful that so many of your members are practitioners in the mental health field. Uh, Lord knows we need them now more than ever before. And we need more uh, of your 
uh, colleagues to go into this space and really blow out a, a workforce pipeline to really fill the enormous need in this country that we have for for workers that just like belong to your union. Um, I just have to say that's got to be one of our top priorities as a nation is to build that workforce pipeline. And that's going to take, you know, a very strategic, legislative, regulatory, political approach to pull together Department of Defense that can't find enough of your clinicians, VA, which can't find enough, private sector, Medicaid. You just cannot find enough clinicians. And these new certified community behavioral health centers need uh, to have enough clinicians to meet the needs. And certainly we're expanding mental health and federally qualified health centers. My point is over and over again, we need you. We need to build a much bigger pipeline. So that is a way of just thanking everybody who's on this, who are in this space for what they do. Um, so, you know, this book, Fred, was really an opportunity for me to also push uh, an agenda. And uh, in the back of the book, I have a QR code called the Alignment for Progress. And uh, in it, we have kind of a 1.0, but frankly, the only one that we've ever as assembled, a legislative agenda that frankly has been non-existent in our movement. You know, you are, your members are all part of uh, AFL-CIO. We need an AFL-CIO for mental health and addiction. Uh, we need to end the silos between all of these trade groups and all of these disease-specific advocacy groups because we all share 99% of the same goals, and yet we all fight over the 1% that we don't agree on. And, and that's got to change. You know, um, If we're going to hold legislators accountable, if we're going to do more than just talk about this and actually make the changes in reimbursement and changing so many of the other uh, aspects we need to get, you know, political. You guys are an example. Unions are an example of holding politicians accountable. And we just need to be doing that for our movement. So um, when I first did my, my initial book on my own story uh, called A Common Struggle, I was amazed when around the country, uh, people were obviously wanting to tell me their stories. I obviously I collected a lot of cards, a lot of names, numbers, and so forth. Um, when COVID happened and it was clear there was a whole new renewed interest in storytelling, but I found that we hadn't really progressed beyond people saying that they have a diagnosis. You know, now people are much more comfortable saying, oh, I, I see a therapist or I have a diagnosis or I've suffered from depression or I'm in recovery from addiction. But frankly, that's where it ends. You know, people do not know when Simone Biles says she has a mental health moment, she can't get on the balance beam. What does that mean? No one has any idea what it's like to actually live with these illnesses, how people negotiate um, their illness with all the other things in their lives, their relationships with their partners, their kids, their siblings, their uh, parents, their coworkers. You know, th these are aspects of the movement that we are frankly need to fill in because this isn't a one in four issue. This is a one in one issue because every single family in America, as we've just seen over the course of the last week with the president's own family, everybody's affected when one member of the family is suffering from one of these illnesses. And as a country, we just have not absorbed that. We have just not come to grips with the fact that as much as we say the statistics augur for some greater urgency, frankly, the fact that we're underselling this whole thing, even as dra dramatic as these statistics are, for what it really is, and that is something that affects every single American in this country. So that's the reason I did the book. I wanted to finally include what are the spouses? How do they negotiate that? How do the kids, how do the co-workers negotiate? Because there isn't a lot of literacy, as you know, in terms of how do we have these conversations and um, and frankly, acknowledgement that these are complex issues, uh, that they're messy, uh, that there isn't a single easy solution like we often are, you know, looking for, um, but that that shouldn't deter us from trying to find a much better 
approach to, to addressing this. And frankly, from a family perspective, since these don't just afflict just the one individual with the diagnosis. Thanks very much, Patrick, and uh, for starting us off. And, and I want to, um, yeah, and, and, and I think that was one of the things that struck me immediately, uh, right with chapter one. Uh, which is the the complexity uh, of the constellation of individuals impacted uh, by the the mental health of one individual and issues that in in this case that she was dealing with. Um, I would like to to pose a question about uh, Philomena Quebec, uh, who you highlighted in that that first chapter, um, and and I paid close attention to the issues that you raised there about the balance between indigenous uh, healthcare wellness practices and so forth, um, and uh, what is usually referred, I'll just refer to as, as Western medicine, um, and how, um, how the balance needs to be struck between both those. And, and that was something that I saw that uh, Philomena struggled with. Um, I, so I guess I have a, a, my first question is about that. If you could address the, the challenges inherent in balancing those two and for, uh, specifically for people who are indigenous, but then the second is, but not exclusively, but the second would be, um, what I did not see in chap in that chapter was a discussion about intergenerational trauma, which, uh, uh, seriously impacts uh, people of color in general. So I guess if you wanted to just, uh, you know, take on both of those uh, to get us going on this part of it, I'd appreciate it. So um, in the book, I'm not trying to make any policy statements or try to educate anybody about anything. I'm just letting the, the stories tell themselves. And I do agree wholeheartedly that these are issues that are cyclical and multi-generational and um, clearly trauma factors, as you could tell from all of these stories, heavily in 90% in, uh, in of the stories in very dramatic ways. Um, the one thing that's consistent with where we need to be is we need to have a cultural competence. Uh, and the point with Philomena, obviously, is that you know, the therapeutic relationship is so important as all of your um, clinicians and members are on this uh, webinar know, you know, what we ultimately want to get to is kind of an Angie's list of, of clinicians who are trained in particular types of cognitive behavioral therapy for particular types of diagnoses. Because to date, we've taken a rather one-size-fits-all approach there's a great theoretical degrees, but there isn't really the practicum of how do you specifically help those with eating disorders vis-a-vis -vis anxiety disorders, vis-a-vis -vis, you know, other serious mental illnesses and, and, and addictions. And then you've got to obviously loop in, you know, because, you know, racial trauma and, you know, sexual trauma and obviously a lot of other issues with uh, identities and so forth really factor into that therapeutic relationship and whether that therapeutic relationship was just so essential for for the bond to happen for therapy to work perfect to in the best optimal way that has to be um, there so if you have someone um you know, it doesn't necessarily they like they all have to look like their patients, but it definitely, I think, would make a big difference, especially with all of the, you know, vicarious trauma we've seen in this country um, with tr Black Lives Matter. And we've seen over and over again in, in other ways and with Native Americans, as you said, I think there comes a certain trust level if someone can understand implicitly without having to do a whole lot of therapy. Listen, I know what you're talking about. I kind of get the idea. Um, you know, you don't need to spell it out for me. I know you kind of understand. That's key. Um, and I think that has to be a factor. And then of course, in her case, she, that was what she was grappling with. Um, in terms of the delivery of a therapy that she could really connect with. 
Yeah, exactly. And and I have to say that um, in in my experiences, and I I've had experiences, direct lived experiences, as well as uh, working more indirectly with with uh, inter, with uh, indigenous folks. Um, and that's where I, you know, uh, encountered rather early in my life uh, conversations about intergenerational trauma, uh, and where it came, where it returned full bore uh, was in the aftermath of the terrorist attack in uh, east side of Buffalo uh, just a couple of years ago on May 14th. Uh, that date is um, burned into my mind, um, and. We had a we had a, a similar kind of panel and a discussion included a discussion of of intergenerational trauma and uh, vicarious impacts uh, and experiences. I, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Dr. Dewitt Parker, um, for your perspective on that and has as you have seen it both as a clinician and the, and then also in in your work at the university. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. And and I really enjoyed this book, I have to say, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, yes, being a clinician, and I've worked in a variety of different roles here at the university for 25 years. I also worked in community mental health for years, and I worked for the Department of Defense. Uh, so I've had a, 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 you know, a wide range of experience. And, you know, trauma is real, and trauma impacts people in so many different ways. You know, there's direct uh, stressors with trauma, as you mentioned, there's vicarious trauma, and then the 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 multi generational or trans generational trauma uh, is is also real. And with all that's happening in the world, uh, there there have been events just this week, just in the past couple of days here in New York State that have um, have been triggers for people. Um, and so it's not racial trauma, but it's cultural trauma because it's it's more around um, the, the Jewish community, you know, there's some things that, that happen in the, the subway system, for example, and um, whatnot. So it impacts all of us. It directly impacts the person who's dealing with that, that trauma because they're more vulnerable. Uh, so if we're employees, it, imp it impacts us at work. Uh, it impacts our family life. It impacts um, our life when we're in the marketplace. And it has that that uh, that effect of just, you become weary, you become worn down, um, people become hopeless, especially when they're dealing with um, oppressive, you know, systems. And that's what we're talking about um, with, with some of this racial and cultural trauma. Uh, but I wanted to mention just in, 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 in the impact with college students, the collegiate mental health, um, the Center for Collegiate Mental Health basically looks at the uh, experiences of students who are in treatment. Now we know that about 15% of students pop, you know, might be in treatment on a college campus. And that means there's so many more students who are impacted who are not in treatment. But one of the things that they found really interesting uh, finding was that obviously anxiety and depression are key issues for students. History of trauma was the mental health item with the largest 10-year increase. Uh, and so that's childhood trauma, that's emotional and sexual violence trauma. So these are students, college students, young people who are coming to college and they've already experienced some trauma. And that could be something that they've experienced themselves or the um, transgenerational trauma or a combination of the two because typically they go hand in hand. Thank you for, for uh, emphasizing that. I, I think, um, yeah, and, it, and, and the point that uh, there may be a certain percentage, but it, it redoubles on its impact throughout a college community, uh, which is the term that I always prefer. It's not a college campus, though I understand why we call it that. It is a community. It is a community. Uh, yeah, people living in close proximity. Um, I, you know, and and Patrick alluded to this earlier on in terms of uh, there has been a change in the way that um, mental health is looked at. But in your work, uh, Joyce, what what do you see as as 
probably the most preeminent misconceptions uh, about mental health that you encounter through the course of, of your work? Uh, the biggest misconception is that mental health issues only impact some people. <laughs> and what I can say is that uh, the brain is connected to the body, number one. And number two, um, mental health issues don't discriminate. Uh, so no, no matter what socioeconomic uh, background you come from, you can be impacted. Uh, no matter what race you are, gender identity, it doesn't really matter. Any of us can be impacted at, at any time. Uh, no matter what your titles are, how much education you have, uh, where you work in a system, whether you're an employee or a student, it doesn't really matter. So that's why I say it doesn't discriminate. Um, and in some cases, it impacts us in ways because so many of us are used to, we just trudge along and, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, um, sorts of people. But that doesn't mean that the mental health issue goes away. And sometimes that can make it even worse if we keep trudging through and we don't get the help we need. And so there's one misconception is that getting help for mental health issues is for somebody else. Nope, that's not the case. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, so we can't ignore the problem. We can't um, stuff it in some way. And so sometimes we try to self-medicate and all of us do this in some way or another. We've done this, you know, like if you've had a bad day, some people might pick up the, you know, the half gallon of ice cream and, you know, that's not going to solve the problem. And so if we try to self-medicate with food or substances or um, work, overwork, right? Or collecting stuff that doesn't get at the issue. It masks the problem, but we, we really just need to talk have conversations with each other about what's happening. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and I think um, it it is a case where, um, you know, we have heard on, on previous panels uh, the challenge of getting people to understand the need to for people to be heard uh, when they are facing these challenges. Um, I, I want to zero in on, a, on another case, Patrick, that, that you highlighted. Um, and in part is because um, from my youngest years, I've been a space enthusiast. And so I, I read with, I mean, all of the stories were so, you know, gut-wrenching at times and at other times so inspiring. Um, but in reading about the, the very gifted aerospace engineer, uh, Naya Butler Craig, um, it was just so compelling that, you know, she, she wanted to achieve now, she wants to be an astronaut, but at the same time, I'll put it in a different way, doesn't want to follow the rules of, um, of in essence, hiding uh, the, the mental health issues that, that she was facing, um, you know, and the, the struggle she has with the psyche strain, the stain that they use, that expression. Um, so I, I guess uh, two points on that. Um, I just said why it, it it resonated for me because of my interest in 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 space, but also the lives of astronauts and and the realization as we have read more and more um, biographies of of early astronauts, there were there were individuals who were dealing with with severe mental health issues back then. Uh, the, unfortunately, the culture was different. You, as Joyce, you were saying, it was it was buried, it was hidden. Um, so the question I would have, and maybe you can't answer the first one, Patrick. I'm dying to know an update about her life and her career. Uh, and second, if you can share that. And second, um, why her? What was about her story that that you felt needed to be told? Uh, and certainly, obviously, it, it captured a lot of our attention. So go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think it's kind of very eclectic to get people from all these different walks of life to kind of open people's eyes. Just, I mean, here is a young woman who is, you know, top fraction of the top 1% of the smartest people in our country. Yeah. Uh, also, a, a Black woman who has got the stigma even greater in the Black community of discussing, but then professionally, she can't think about talking about it because it will impede her progress. Uh, 
So there's, as I said, I let the stories themselves kind of, you know, address the, rather than say these are issues, you know, let the stories say that they're issues. And, and it's clear from reading Naya's, um, you know, story that that's the case. Um, I, I, I've stayed in touch with all of the uh, profiles. Uh, I talked to them, you know, relatively frequently, some, some of them more than others. Um, I just uh, did an intro with uh, uh, J Justin Maffitt with a, a member of Congress because he's looking to get on the Hill. He wants to go into the Foreign Service. He wants to get in the State Department. Um, I, I reconnected him to Al Sharpton. He had felt like uh, he was worried about reconnecting with Al because when he had his uh, psychotic break, you know, Al was there, saw it all, and 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 and. Just and just felt terrible about all that. And he never bothered to reconnect. You know, I'm in recovery from addiction. Part of our job is to try to come to grips with our past and not ignore it. And you kind of have to go as part of our amends process to back to the people whose lives we've impacted and try to make amends or have some connection. Um, I don't know necessarily what that's like for people who've had those issues on the mental health side when, you know, they go back. But but Justin found it was enormously helpful to reconnect to Sharpton, who he worked with. Al Sharpton loved being able to reconnect. And it reminded me of when I had to go make amends to this um, person, very prominent political person. And uh, I was terrified about crossing the room. And, and you know, because the last time I had spoken to them, I had just cursed them out and very it was so humiliating for me to have to to you know make amends but i went and when i was able to do that the the embrace that they gave me and the acceptance like i knew you were struggling and you know hearing what you you come to me like this has me even greater more profound respect you know and there's the last thing i was expecting after the way i had treated this person you know as the case is dr to what Parker knows, um, everybody else knows we're suffering. We're the last ones to know. And so when we like are able to reconnect with folks, they're like, oh, thank God, I have a chance to finally see you try to come out the other side. So, um, so you know, Naya's come to, to terms with the fact that her having been so outspoken is an issue for her. But I think the Doing the book, ironically, may give her hopefully a little bit leg up on things because I'm going to be a huge champion for her. And last time I checked, the it, it is the you know the Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I might be able to get through and and tell people to 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 take a look at what a you know awesome resume and CV she is. You know, when I was in Congress and had the chance to work with the military, I was on the defense uh both appropriations and armed services committees it was interesting because the military was going through the same thing is it a um a security challenge if someone has a mental illness and you know the they've turned around obviously there's still so much uh difficulty for people to come forward because they're worried about losing you know security clearance or ability to have a firearm and the like. But um, if we get people help, none of that should be a problem. And so um, in fact, the military is starting to see mental health uh, as uh, as an asset if people are getting help, you know, which it should be. Like the the I remember going through and rededicating the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center for the Green Berets. And, they said to me, they have more mental health per Green Beret than any other soldier, military official, personnel in the military. And I said, these Green Berets, they don't need mental health. You know, they jump out of airplanes and they swim underwater for five miles without breathing. And they they hit the, the beach and they're speaking six languages and they take out their targets and they're reading to their kids by bedtime. I mean, why do they need mental health? And the the thing is is that because they need to be able to have eyes on the prize have total clear picture on what their mission is they can't have any intrusive thoughts they can't have any counterproductive thinking patterns they have to have their eyes on the mission 
And that's the way the military looks at mental health. They're not looking at it as a half full thing. They see this as a ha you know an opportunity for us to really accentuate people's strengths. And really, when you think about it today, this is the differentiator. It's a differentiator for employers. If you're really into mental health, that is an asset that you bring that, frankly, maybe not all of the others that you'd be competing against bring. And it's actually the value that the employers really put a high premium on, as does the military, because these skills of self-modulating and correcting these uh, counterproductive thinking patterns, I mean, they're real skills. They're, they're not soft skills. They're real skills and can determine someone's economic success, determine their military success. I'm hoping that it's not to be long. That I, I think she's so nice, so young, there's going to be a lifetime of opportunities for her. Because who in the world doesn't, you know, have challenges, uh, as uh, Dr. DeWitt Parker mentioned? Yeah, I think it's a it's it's like mental health parity, right? So if if she had uh, thyroid dysfunction, <laughs> or if she had diabetes, um, people would treat it more compassionately. I mean, with an astronaut, it might be a different issue, you know. But but when it comes to being in the workplace, um, why should it be any different than having um, any other disorder in the body? Uh, but we we do treat it differently because of the stigma that's attached to it with and we treat it with a lot less compassion. I yeah. thought Naya's point about I can reach for the stars, but if I'm not here, I can't do that. You yeah. know, that idea that, oh, I'm not here, like because she's had, you know, the thought of suicide just she at least has that perspective that she can be chasing her tail as we all do trying to get ahead but in the process if she's not seeing the forest from the trees so to speak and understanding that she's never going to get ahead if she's no longer around because you know mental illness is unforgiving it it will take you out and if you're not making mental your mental health your priority then nothing else will be successful i think that was kind of another underlying message in Naya's story that that uh, to, to rebalance kind of what she thought of as success. Yeah, she's going to be a success no matter what she does, right? right? And her, her dream is, is space. Now, I guarantee there's a million ways that she can be part of the science behind it because she's so smart. But, you know, maybe it's an adjustment because maybe now her real, real goal is making sure that her mental health is sound. And if that's good, then everything else is possible. You know, as we um, we think about the fact that uh, take a look, we've got about we got 180 people on, and and I would wager that um, you know 99% of them are involved in in higher education at some at some level. And I'm seeing in the chat some some interesting things popping too. Please, folks, uh, put questions, comments, observations. Uh, please do so. Um, there was, um, it was, uh, I know it was on page 48 because I dog-eared the page. Um, and it was about the University of Pennsylvania establishing a new position, a chief wellness officer. Um, and uh, Joyce, in your background, you talk about the fact that uh, you were instrumental in getting uh, the University of Albany as designated as a health promoting university. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation to those, you know, much uh, like we were talking about, Naya, about, you know, successful with dreams, those are our students. Um, and so the question I have for you, Joyce, uh, to begin this, this part of the conversation is, um, is what was established at University of Pennsylvania, is that very unique um, or is that... Uh, something that's becoming more and more common, and and does that? How does that correspond to, for instance, what the work you're doing with your team at Albany? Mm -hmm. um, my position is assistant vice president for health and well-being, uh, and so I'm responsible for those those units that are directly involved in in uh, healthcare. Um, that position, in and of itself, is a fairly new position too. Uh, that's been for probably the past uh, five to seven, maybe 10 years. 
And a part of the reason for that, the development of that position was because everyone was doing their work in silos. And so if there's one person providing leadership and vision for it, we can break down the silos between the, the physical health, the bodily health and the mental health and also include recreation, for example. Um, the chief wellness officer position is also very, very new. Um, and I actually, um, you know, with that story, it was interesting to read that story because I knew Greg Ills, who was the director of um, the counseling center at uh, at Penn, and and he um, he died by suicide. Um, so it was it was interesting to read that because I know some of the the backstory to that. Um, but this chief wellness officer position is a new position. And typically what this is about is taking the student affairs side, which I work on, but also looking at um, the employee's uh, experience too. And we at, Un at the University of Albany as a health promoting campus are interested in, and this is aspirational, but we're interested in looking at the experience of everybody who lives, works and, and plays on campus. Because we know that if employees aren't feeling supported, then students are not feeling supported, right? Um, it's almost like when you you have to put the mask on yourself first before you you uh, give the oxygen mask to to a, a young person that you're traveling with on a plane. So the same thing is true. So if we have a healthier environment, it's better for everybody. So that chief wellness officer position typically is looking at um, the employee health as well as student health. Um, so oftentimes it's like um, um, a vice presidential level position um, and really looking at synergies and looking at breaking down the silos because some of what can help students can also help employees and staff. Um, so it's usually at a cabinet level position, but yes, it's a very new position, probably the past three to five years. And do you see it having having a real positive impact uh, among the students that we serve? Yes, because what happens, I think, is when when faculty and staff are willing to have conversations with students, be human with students, um, share with them their own struggles, then students open up. And students are more than just uh, a placeholder in a room, uh, but they are a human being who has thoughts and feelings and voice. And so I do think it makes an impact, a positive impact on students. That's really important. Yeah, that's good. Um, Patrick, in, in your work nationally, um, do, you, do you see that kind of greater emphasis uh, in higher educational institutions um, in a, you know, in a direct fashion as, as Joyce was saying. Yeah. You know, I, um, the Phil and Donna Sato used to do fundraisers for me there. I could literally count the number of people on one hand who ever raised money for me because I sponsored parody tells you a lot about, you know, how stigma plays out in every single way, because even to this day, philanthropy is so anemic, even while all the headlines scream at us, that there's a major public health issue. Really? Really. We are, we have the biggest gift we've gotten so far is 30 million to NAMI last year from, um, you know, McKinsey Bezos and God bless her for doing it. But that's what one hour of uh, profits for her with her, you know, I, I just, you know, there's uh, 780 billionaires in this country. I can guarantee at least a third of them have serious issues with mental health and addiction. And I also guarantee you they're giving hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars away to the arts and to other cancer and to a whole lot of other things, but mental health. Uh, and, and even the federal government, um, we've had more money spent than ever before. And it's still a fraction of what we spent on HIV AIDS, where we lost for 53,000 lives a year. We were spending uh, 24 billion then. We, you know, most we got last year is 11 billion, terrific. So still half of what uh, we got HIV AIDS. And, you know, we're losing the same amount of people as HIV AIDS just from suicide. 
Then you add the 120,000 from overdose. Then you add the 300,000 who die of alcohol use disorder, which by the way, no one talks about. No one talks about alcohol use disorder. And, and then you add all of the disability uh, that comes with our kids suffering from record rates of anxiety and depression. It, it's astounding that we don't have, you know, when we had COVID, we didn't even bother asking any questions. How much is this going to cost? We didn't say how, you know, we just said, how soon can we get the vaccination? We cleared away all the bureaucracies to get what we needed. Uh, cancer, we don't even think about what the price tag is. We've spent trillions and trillions of dollars. Thank God. I mean, everyone in my family has had cancer. I'm all for that. But at the end of the day, we are nickel and dime in this problem. And I go back to the political point I made. If we could get a listserv, Fred, of every trade group, you know, psychiatry, psychology, social worker, peer, every, um, you know, depression, bipolar, eating disorder, you know, schizophrenia, we got every group from Faces of Voices Recovery, Active Minds, NAMI, Mental Health America, we added them all up and had one list serve. And then I could go to anybody running for office of so the mayor, state rep, U.S. Congress and say, I've got this list of people that are in your district that are voting on mental health. And then like you do with your union, if I could say to candidates running for that seat, whatever it is, these are the things we expect if you want our support. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here, Fred. And yet in mental health and addiction, we have nothing like that. It is all we're doing, we're at the the whim of whatever the politicians give us. And then we're like, oh, thank you, thank you. I remember one of my colleagues announced a $685 million children's mental health appropriations for SAMHSA. That's for the country. That's laughable. And yet they all did a big parade and how great they were. And everyone was heaping, you know, praise on them. And, you know, yeah, we'll give them praise. But listen, that's, you know, maybe enough for Rhode Island. I mean, I mean, but seriously, we we have we can't see the forest from the trees. We have no perspective in this space about what true progress means. And the only reason I use these analogous things to how much we spend on other illnesses is that at least gives us a sense of how pitiful our response to this crisis is. As much as the fact that we are doing 500 percent more year over year in the last five years, it's still a pittance against what the, the times demand. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm watching the chat and please put questions in. Um, and by the way, I want to say Tony Dreyer's on. She's one of my uh, real profiles and courage in this book. Uh, I know I've seen a couple of the uh, oh, fantastic. comments and uh, about what a difference her uh, chapter meant to individuals that are right now watching this webinar. I hope, Tony, you saw those. They were unsolicited because I saw people talk about how impactful your chapter was to them before I even could see that you were on this uh, in this call. So I hope you can understand how grateful people are to you for having put yourself out there the way you have. Absolutely. It's an honor to share this uh, virtual space with you. Thank you so much. Um, there is a there's a question um, in in the chat um, and I'll I'll lead with with Joyce on this one. And um, and, and that is. How do you how do you measure progress? And I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, um, as we've heard, and Patrick so eloquently uh, took us on a on a trip through, you know, where we are being deficient as a society uh, in dealing with this. Uh, and sometimes I prefer to use the term series of crises because they are. Um, so, Joyce, how would you uh, measure measure progress? That's a tough one. Um... 
All right. How to measure process, prog progress? Well, on our campus, and I'm sure many other campuses, we uh, we do surveys, and that's only one part of it. Uh, so we collect data, and every year we have a sense about where students are, what matters to students. We also look at, we, we conducted a survey a couple of years ago for faculty, staff, and students because we were interested in um, the experiences of employees. This was during COVID. So as you can imagine, you know, stress was high, telecommuting was, a, was uh, on everybody's minds. And so um, we do surveys every spring with students. And then we also do focus groups because qualitative data is only one part of it. We need qualitative data too. We need, stories are really important. Storytelling is, um, you know, a, a, a part of indigenous communities. And we have learned that storytelling is very healing for folks. So having people tell their stories um, and share their stories through focus groups. And then, you know, we measure things like flourishing. And um, through measures of flourishing, we have a better sense about how the community is doing but we also know on a college campus, you know, the student cycle, life cycle is, is, is about four to five years or four to six years, depending on who you talk to. Um, but that's one, one aspect of what we do. And um, other than that, uh, I, I, we have climate surveys on campuses too. And that's another way to measure what's happening with folks, how safe they feel on a campus, and then to measure over time. But I think a part of this is we need we need to be better about disaggregating data because as Mr. Kennedy said, not you know, not everybody's experience, um, you know, people have different experiences and we have different groups on campus that we need to pay attention to. So we need to disaggregate the data so that we understand that when we say employees, the experience of an, an African heritage employee might be very different than the experience of an indigenous employee or an Asian employee. Um, and we also need to um, follow up with folks by sharing the data out with them. We, we tend to hold on to data ra rather than sharing that data with the community so that they can react to it. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question fully, no. but I, I think that those are some steps in the right direction. I think so. And it is, uh, I mean, the scope of the issues are, are so huge. Um, there's, a, there's a question in, in the chat that I want to um, direct to, to you, Patrick. Uh, and uh, and I'll just read it from the chat. Thanks to, to Mindy, Mindy Benning from Empire State University. Um, oh, and now they're, it just moved away. Uh, it's about Senator uh, elected two years ago now, right? Uh, Senator John Fetterman um, has his discussion um, and discussions about his mental health issues in your estimation has, has that moved the needle in a positive direction? Well, you know, the fact that he was able to get care right away yeah. because he's a member of Congress was the big takeaway there because every other American has to wait months and months and months. And by the way, all of his care was paid for, which like unlike every other American is never the case. Um, if you're getting a child adolescent uh, therapist, you're a thousand times more likely to be out of pocket, out of network. So we have uh, such issues of just insurance companies paying for this. And I want to add, you should send out, hopefully the Biden administration in the beginning of July, but it's going to be in July, the Biden administration has this new parity enforcement rule that uh, we've been working with them on that's going to dramatically change the whole landscape. It's going to require every insurance company and every employer in this country um, to guarantee equal access, which is an enormous challenge because we don't have the in-network capacity, as I spoke about earlier. It's going to require that insurance companies pay equally for mental health providers as they do other physical health providers. Uh, even psychiatrists who are kind of at the top of the pyramid earn 35% less than nurse practitioners. No wonder so many of them are cash pay and are totally out of the network. 
Um, to your original point, uh, we have a, um, a goal. 90% of Americans screened for these illnesses. We wouldn't think of anything else if it were cancer or cardiovascular disease. We routinely screen for these things and other things everywhere. 90% of Americans getting evidence-based treatment. We expect that from cancer to cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Why shouldn't we expect for the same for mental? 90% of Americans receiving chronic care management and supportive recovery services, which for our illnesses means paying for the clubhouse model, paying for recovery residences that are six months to a year for people to get back their lives back, which takes a great deal of time and support, but frankly is cheaper than paying for multiple, you know, spin dry kind of short stays at, at re rehabs and detoxes. So my point is we know what progress looks like. It's just how quickly can we get there? And unfortunately, even those of us in the mental health say, oh, that's too ambitious. Oh, what 90? We'll be lucky if we can make it to 50. We're at 15% today. So how? So, well, okay. This is a matter of political will now. It's a, not a matter of anything else. We have the whole roadmap. We've already outlined it. Every committee in Congress has a to-do list. It's on our a QR code in the back of our book, um, Alignment for Progress. We have a, a strategy.alignmentforprogress.org. I, I grant you it's about a 1.0. We need a 3 or 4.0. But I have aggregated every single mental health proposal, every Surgeon General's report, put it in, uh, curated by committee of Congress, and so that we have every, so, it, you know, great Fetterman, super. But you know what? I want every single member of Congress to know what they can do for this issue, you know, and it shouldn't be because you just got the spotlight put on you and you went and got help. Every single member has their own stories, I guarantee you. And now, oh, I'm on the Ag Committee. I can't help you. No, you can't help us. There's plenty of things, including um, food supports, because if you're not getting adequate food supports, you know, all the mental health in the world is not going to... Housing, I guarantee over half of my colleagues on the housing committee do not realize how important stable housing is to the delivery of successful um, mental health. Um, I guarantee 90% of my colleagues do not know that in the Department of Labor bill that you have the Employee Benefits Security Administration, which regulates whether insurance companies can impose much higher thresholds in terms of pre-authorization for care much higher uh, medical management uh, thresholds in terms of concurrent review and retroactive review. If this stuff sounds esoteric to you, it's not. It's everything to do with the provision of mental health care because if it's not paid for, it's not, it's not gonna happen. And we need payment. Our biggest goal has to be reforming the reimbursement system. So we're not just paying for services, Fred, we're paying for outcomes. We're, so for people, like I said, with severe mental illness, the clubhouse models ought to be paid for everywhere in this country. It's like senior centers for people with severe, severe and persistent mental illness. Um, recovery community organizations, which again are like senior centers for people in, in recovery, ought to be in every community in America. It, you know, these are some basic things. We ought to have coordinated specialty care mandated in every insurance plan in this country. Because if you have your first instance of psychosis and you don't get that evidence-based coordinated specialty care, forget about it. Your illness is going to pathologize. The, the possibility of you ending up on the street is exponentially higher. How in the world, in this day and age, with so many of our fellow Americans living on the street with open psychosis in active addiction, and we're not doing a better job at early intervention? Um, nurse family partnership, you know, ACE scoring, addressing the early impact of children's trauma. Uh, I mean, we know the correlation. So, what does that bring us to? We need a payment model that captures the ROI of those early interventions. We are never going to tackle this, Fred, if we're paying for services after they're 15 years old. We need to be paying for services when they're two and three years old 
because we know that will dramatically impact a, at a population level the number of people who are going to be suffering from the disability of these illnesses. If you're born into a family where there's a parent who's suffering from a mental illness, addiction, have been incarcerated and the like, you know, the, the I mean, this is not direct corollary, but, you know, we work in the big, broader picture of statistics and the statistics show those are the high risk populations that we should not be wondering and scratching our head why they have a problem down the line. So I, I, we just need a much more uh, aggressive. We, as I said, we know what to do, Fred. It's just a matter of doing it. And, and frankly, because we don't have those political organizations like unions, because we don't have voters coming out from underneath the church basements who are people in 12-step recovery who understand that it's no violation of 11th tradition to say that you're a person in long-term recovery uh, without having to identify the particular 12-step group that you're a member of. Like 90% of my friends in recovery have no idea how to talk about recovery in a way that they feel comfortable, which makes them, you know, missing in action in our political uh, discussions in this country. If we can't surface the, the political activism that can come from people with lived experience who have a passion for this, who can do something about this. I mean, so, you know, we've taught, we can talk. I mean, I can, you can feel the frustration. We can talk till the day is long on stigma and everything else. As we knew from civil rights movement, you're going to always have racism, but what you're going to change when you pass laws like civil rights, like fair housing, fair employment, voting rights, is you make it illegal for people to discriminate. It's not going to change what people think or the, their biases, but you make it illegal. Today, we are not making it illegal for people to discriminate. I have a friend who went out on disability with OCD. You know that was not paid for by his disability insurance. He was a pay. He paid for that. Uh, it helped that disability insurance. If he had had Parkinson's, he would have gotten paid for because he has OCD, which by the way, is enormously disabling. He gets zero insurance. And forget trying to get life insurance if you're a person in recovery from addiction. You're just not going to get it. So there is so many systemic uh, challenges we need to take on, uh, Fred. And most of all, if we don't have the political muscle all this stuff is is hot air. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. Um, there was uh, there been there been a number of of great uh, entries into the the chat, and um, I guess one question, and and it's it's a bit based on on uh, comments that were made in a variety of different things that I've seen along the way, um, has to do with. Um, Within the workplace, uh, the stress that we face, um, how to overcome, on the one hand, the fear of, you know, yes, we have protections as a unionized employment uh, sector, but still the fear of uh, the stigma and the impacts it could have on your career to to express or, or uh, to take on the mental health challenges you face. Uh, but similarly, uh, you know, how many of us are able to raise issues with those, uh, whether they be in our family or in our workplace, or where we see that there are mental health challenges that are going uh, unresolved and that it is then spreading. And And I saw something in there about um, people who work in residential life uh, and the challenge of working with students who have uh, mental health issues that have to be dealt with. Um, and it, yeah, there's a burnout factor that we all are aware of. So I'll start with you, Joyce, on that in terms of overcoming those barriers, but then also being of assistance in getting help for those who need it. Yeah, well, I think um, the first thing is just to remember that we're human. We're all human beings and we need to be humans um, we've become more and more isolated in the world we live in. Um, social media, there are pros and there are cons with social media, right? And um, we all want to feel that we we like we belong in a, a place. And so that means that we need to connect. And that's not 
probably the best way to connect through social media, but to connect in person. So to check in with, with our colleagues and with um, our friends and our family. And, you know, basically a part of being human for me is to, if I notice that someone doesn't seem like themselves, uh, to, to have a conversation with them about it. I noticed that you, you, you know, uh, like if their behavior is different and to name it um, and to just check in with them. And, but in order for people to be honest about how they really feel, there needs to be a certain level of trust. And I think sometimes we live in, you know, we're dealing with toxic environments. And so it's not always safe for people to do that. And so folks have to find out who their, their allies or their accomplices might be, you know, those people who can, um, can be their go-tos. There was someone who talked about building support groups or support systems. And yeah, I think that's, that's one thing to do. Um, I know I have some colleagues and they develop book clubs. And so they, they might read a self-help book together and then talk about it and make sure that that's a safe space for them to, to um, share. So it might be smaller groups. I think the other thing is just um, to recognize that, that students are also human. And I think if there's anything that has reminded us in this past couple, three, four years is that whatever students are dealing with or our patients are dealing with, if you work in healthcare, we're dealing with it too. Um, and there's a huge burden. The one thing I noticed about the, the story about Philomena was she was dealing with the, the burden of caring for herself and also caring for other people. And so we often forget about the care caregivers uh, in, in our workplaces, our colleagues, um, the burden that's on caregivers, whether they're male or female, the, the, the burden is there. And also the burden of um, the burden that's on our support staff. We, we often in a workplace, they're often forgotten about and they have they have in, op, in many cases less voice than other other professionals, but they're professionals in their own right. And we need to check on them, too, um, and uh, be in this together. So I think we need to talk. We need to be human. We need to connect. And even within the SUNY system, for example, there's a QPR, which is question, persuade, and refer. Uh, so it's a free program that anybody can use. And it gives you the tools that you need to um, be able to have those conversations with people. And so that's readily available to everybody in the SUNY system. And I, you know, I, I just wanted to bring that up to you. Thanks very much, Joyce. Um, that's that's really helpful. And I think um, I remember, you know, I'm I'm on leave now in this role, but I remember being uh, challenged and frustrated um, by my ignorance uh, in terms of dealing with students who clearly uh, were suffering uh, in, in with mental health crises, and for that matter, a colleague of mine. Um, literally his office was next door to mine, um, tragically passed away just to, I think it was last year. Um, and it, you know, this is, this is what transpires. And it was what you were talking about, Patrick, in terms of the human cost, uh, the lives lost that, that we totally, uh, um, we ignore as a society, uh, yeah. to our detriment. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to just, I, I forgot to mention one thing. So yeah, oftentimes but, on a college, you know, environment, we will refer people to CAPS, um, but the, the human part of it that I was I was trying to you know talk about is just to connect. Whatever office we're in, we can have just a one minute conversation with a, an individual, um, a student, a, a staff member. But that one minute conversation could make a huge difference for someone. And what we have found is that oftentimes there, there's a certain segment of students that don't necessarily need mental health care, but they need connection. They need to feel that they belong. Um, and we need to provide those tools for folks. And so, you know, mental health care is one end of the spectrum, but we need a lot of resources and funding for health literacy and health education and prevention that would prevent some folks from getting to that point of feeling so desperate and like they have nowhere to turn. Um, so that one minute conversation can, can do wonders for someone else. I love yeah. that Dr. DeWitt Parker. I think that, you know, I heard John Sharon who ran VA out in uh, 
Los Angeles said that what people need are people in their lives. They need a safe place. That's the other P. They need purpose. And finally, we need payment to be able to pull these things together. And that requires coordination. And what we need is an executive office in the White House and in every governor's office that pulls together all the pieces of the different federal state funding streams and organizes them so that if our goal is to tackle the tragedy of, of homelessness, of people suffering with a mental illness and being homeless or addiction to homeless, that we, we tackle the housing piece, but we also make sure there's the proper human services, we have the right health care, and we have the, a lot of big chunk of dollars from the justice system, which frankly is the default mental health provider. Yeah mental health provider in the country because we are we are funding a system that encourages us to put bed, heads in beds in our justice system. We need to say to anyone, you know, bidding on a contract to run a jail or prison, you can get this, but you have to, you get a bonus if you reduce recidivism from 50% in two and a half years to 20% you get to keep this amount of money. So all of a sudden, if I'm a contractor, I'm going to say, I better get that housing, that community center, make sure those job skills are put in place. And, and as far as the colleges, universities, we need a core. Uh, President Kennedy called on our country to have a, you know, to serve our nation. We have an opportunity to get people into jobs that pay for their tuition. There are plenty of industries where they pay 100% in the job for tuition support. So what we can do is set up cores where people can get, uh, you know, out in the West, they have uh, kids as part of these uh, AmeriCorps programs that clean up after fires. We know there's fires all the time. we got floods in Philadelphia. There's a, a core that basically contracts with the city. It's all young people. And they they every week they they do their um, you know get their education they're part of a group they get uh, oversight like the with the AmeriCorps in the schools um, we have conservation corps we have senior corps there are seniors who are lonely they can be part of foster grandparents they can uh, do other services helping other seniors um, with going to a doctors meeting going to get their groceries. The point is Americans want to help one another. We're more you know, isolated than other bef ever before. We need to create a system where people can get connected. And, uh, and as uh, Dr. DeWitt Parker said, we also need people to understand the value that, uh, frankly, in giving, everybody will quickly realize that makes them feel good. And if they're like, uh, you know, anyone like me, and you start to know that you feel better if you do something, you will, you'll do it more and more. <laughs> and uh, ha there's nothing more satisfying in, in recovery than being able to, and which is our mission in recovery, to help the next suffering um, person out there with the disease of alcoholism and addiction. So, um, you know, we, we have to set up a culture that promotes you know, this kind of well-being to the to the doctor's point, because we can treat these diseases when they become pathologized, when people get disabled because of their depression, and anxiety, all of which are compounded if they're less socially connected. But if I don't feel like I can tell my story, if I can't share what's going on with me. And by the way, if I can't listen to someone and know how to be an attentive listener and know how uh, you know, so there's great deal of need for literacy, as the doctor mentioned as well. So um, we can be allies. We can be helpful servants. There has to be a call to action, though, for our country. Um, and for those who are going in this space because they have had mental health challenges in their lives, we ought to make it a lot easier for them to find a career ladder um, whereby they can support themselves and their families because you know, we stack degrees so that as they pro progress professionally, they can get the income, they can support a family. Um, 
And, and that's where payment will be so key, which is why the parity rule uh, this this July is going to be so key. So um, there's not only mental health literacy interpersonally, but there's mental health literacy policy wise that's going to be important because we all have to be advocates. You know, we, we, we can't just think about this in the microcosm. We also have to think about how we can reshape the way the whole system is organized. Well, we, we have reached well beyond the one hour mark. Uh, no surprise. Um, and also no surprise. Um, Christy Sammons, one of our, our great staff members uh, who worked with me to put this together. She did the real, um, the real work. Um, we were joking before we started as uh, she gave me some questions that we had worked on that she had and I had. And, and, and she said, you know, as usual, we're not going to get through half of these. And that's the case once again. Um, and there was so many, uh, there were so many great comments in the chat that I would like to get to. Um, here's what I would like to propose uh, to all of us and uh, on as uh, observers and certainly to our two guests, our panelists, um, is that we do this again, um, that we find space in our, our calendars as busy as they might be, uh, where we could do a follow up uh, and continue to explore these issues. And, uh, and what my hope would be um, is that we can, through this work, as yes, still the largest higher education union in the country, um, we can continue to raise our collective voices in a way that will impact what the state of New York does, what State University of New York does, and what the country does at the federal level. Uh, we advocate aggressively for so much, um, and in one of our you know, major components in our agenda the last few years has been a mental health education opportunity program that would facilitate the creation of a pipeline. We need to get more people into the professions and we need to get uh, diverse uh, folks with diverse backgrounds into those professions. Uh, I want to I want to just simply close with a great deal of thanks to all of you who joined us uh, today in the audience for your questions, for your comments, uh, and and then especially uh, to you, uh, Dr. Joyce Dewitt Parker, for once again being a part of a, a UUP gathering and adding so much to the gathering, and uh, to you, Patrick Kennedy. Uh, for again joining a, a UUP event, and uh, we will uh, look forward to our next uh, work together. And uh, you have told me long ago, uh, as I full information for the audience, I served um, on his father's staff back when I was a graduate student uh, in DC. And Patrick, you told me, yeah, once a Kennedy staffer, always a Kennedy staffer. And so uh, it's been a privilege once again uh, to work with both of you as I have worked with you both in the past. And uh, it's good to see you as well. Uh, and that you're, I hope you're both doing very well. Um, well, thank you so much, Fred. You know, um, we're this is a historic time in our country, not just politically, but culturally, and we are writing the history of tomorrow. And if we engage, as previous generations have engaged in changing civil rights, changing environmental, changing women's rights, if we do that today for mental health, we will advance more opportunities and access for millions of Americans who, if we don't get active, this is not just going to happen uh, in a vacuum. So I love what you guys do. And uh, Dr. DeWitt Parker, it's such a great honor to be with you, uh, who you're doing such great work. And I, I let's do it again. It's great. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Uh, be well, be safe, and we'll see you again soon.